Welcome all to the BioVant panel today. We're really excited to have you all here. And I don't know if you've walked around the trade show floor, but there's been a lot of buzz. I've talked to a lot of farmers that are excited to learn more about biologicals. And we've got three fantastic farmers who have lots of stories to share. And we're gonna talk about those and maybe some of the misconceptions that exist around biologicals. Because a common belief is that yield winners, we've got a couple up here on the stage with us, they're dumping a lot of input and fertilizers and cost into those high acres. It's not economically sustainable to do that, as I'm sure these gentlemen will share here in just a little bit, but we're bringing in a new generation of growers that are changing the narrative. And, and how is by focusing on soil health, which is what we're gonna talk a lot about today, adapting biological products and refining cultural practices. They've shown consistently that they can set record yields on their farms while slashing input costs, seed, fertilizer, pesticides, and more. So we're gonna talk about all those things first, but I wanted to do a quick introduction to our gentlemen panelists up here. I am Delaney Howell, host of the Ag News Daily Podcast. Certainly excited to be with you all today. And we've, as I mentioned, got three fantastic gentlemen up here who are veterans in this space. First, we've got Jimmy Frederick, who is a farmer in Rulo, Nebraska. And Jimmy, you might recognize him. He's got a few soybean records himself. He is a, a dryland farmer in Rulo, Nebraska, and a soybean contest winner through Bayer. So certainly has some interesting things to share with us today. We've also got Matt Brinks, who is a farmer in Northeastern Iowa, completely removed commercial fertilizer from his operation. and has an interesting story to share as well. Didn't grow up or didn't take over his family's farm and actually started working with a farmer, he said in sixth grade, and eventually had the opportunity to take over that farm's plan and, and now farming full-time there with his wife. And lastly, we've got Greg McClure, who is the Illinois corn yield champion on the border of Illinois and Indiana, farms with his children, got a couple of those kids involved in the farm and you not only farm corn and soybeans but also hogs as well so you certainly stay busy and with that in mind gentlemen let's uh start to talk a little bit here about some of the myths or misconceptions that go on in agriculture and, and biological space and folks i want to remind you you may see sitting on your table a qr scan code we're using a platform today called Pigeonhole, which will allow you to all ask your own questions here towards the end. We're gonna do a Q&A portion. If you just scan that QR scan code, I know we're probably used to it, so going out to restaurants now, a lot of these have them. You can just scan that QR scan code there and enter in your passcode, which is BioVant 2022, and that will allow you to enter our session and start asking some of those fantastic questions to our panelists up here. You can also upvote and downvote those questions. So if there's any that you see you really wanna get some answers to, we'll make sure we get those answered here towards the end. But again, that QR scan code there, you can enter at any time today and throw your questions in there. And with that, gentlemen, let's get started. So let's talk about the first misconception, which is you can't be a yield champion and an ROI champion. Two of you guys up here are yield champions. One of you is an ROI champion that we're deeming today. Matt, let's start with you. Let's start to maybe think about this. Is this true or false, that you can't be a yield and ROI champion? What are your thoughts? I'm definitely going to go with the false side on this one because uh, you can lower inputs and increase your yields. You can let things out. It's uh, definitely going to go false on this. Jimmy? Yeah, definitely false. Um, it's been a misconception for a long time. Bios do way more for your soil than you could ever imagine. So it's definitely false. And I want to ask a, a follow-up question, mm -hmm. Jimmy, because they're in your farm, dry land farming. Tell us a little bit about your operation and, and how you know this to be false. Because <clears throat> um, I've worked my way towards both of them. Um, dry land different soil types CECs are different 7 to 30 um, have some irrigated bottom have some dry land hills um, it, it's different placement for different products but there is a home for each one of them and the value of the product the quality of the product is also very important to match with the different soil types 
All right, Greg, what are your thoughts? I know you you guys do a lot of test plots at, at your farm. Yeah, and I, th I think, uh, you know, we strive to do both uh, every year. And I, we use our contest ground or what it, our plot areas. We use those. That's where we're doing all of our science. That's where we're doing all of our research, where we're trying to figure out what are those things. And we're going to spend some money on that area because we're going to try to we're going to try new products, new theories, new concepts. It's like developing any any product that anybody sells anywhere. You've got to have the research side of it, the foundation of it, the building blocks that go into building that product, and that's all going to be an expense at that point. And that's how we look at it. That's the money that we're paying, putting forward for our future. And out of that, we extract those items over the next two or three years. Those things that we just, that we find that have an annual positive ROI, then we start going and applying those against the other acres. So how many acres are we really, you know, we're trying to set a new record for ourselves. We're trying to figure out what that is. That's on a small amount of acres compared to where we're focusing on the ROI, but we have to use that to move back into the ROI acres, how to make a living. And I'm glad that you mentioned research because all three of you have put in a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of resources into doing research on what works and, and what doesn't. And Matt, I think your story in particular is really interesting to talk about how you've completely removed commercial fertilizer from your operation. Why did you, why did you try, try doing that? It's a, a long, interesting story, but this goes all the way back to the 90s. We started doing learning blocks. We do, uh, you know, really crazy amounts of fertilizer on an acre. We do zero, and then we do our normal spread. And we were just finding uh, the more fertilizer we put on, we weren't getting any yield at all. So I knew that these guys over here, they were winning all the contests. They were doing something other than just pouring fertilizer because <coughs> I wasn't winning anything just pouring fertilizer. So we started doing a tremendous amount of products and strips from a lot of companies, trying to figure out these different avenues and um, just pulling back on products and finding our yields were coming up and uh, started working with guys like Chris and, and BioVant and um, learning more about the soil and the plant and how important timing was and natural health of the soil. and. Um, yeah, it was just, it all started back with the learning blocks about um, realizing that these guys just aren't pouring more fertilizer on. There's a heck of a lot more that goes into this plant than fertilizer. And uh, a lot of times you can mess it up by just putting more fertilizer on. And Matt, I probably didn't do your story justice at the beginning with, I know we, we talked a little bit before Commodity Classic, but you, you'd started working with this farmer in sixth grade. and. I think you made the comment to me that you were basically trying to capture as much ROI on the acres you had available to you because as we all know we've seen record farmland sales this year and it's a little hard to continue to uh, expand but how have you been able to continue to improve that ROI and, and maybe share a little bit more of your story that I didn't do justice to. It, uh, trying to get a family farm started because I got two daughters 17 and 14 now that both seem to have an extreme interest in farming and uh, Iowa land is not cheap to rent or buy. A lot of well-established farms, multi-generations in the neighborhood. I was fortunate to meet this guy in school and uh, become his hired hand and get an avenue in, but I figured I'm kind of locked in on his acres. So I figured the only way we're going to survive on, uh, on this is we're going to figure out how to get more money out of these acres because we're not going to get more acres. So we really started trying to, to tweak and figure out how we can make more money and make a living off what we had. Now an interesting antidote to this is after doing this all these years, people have started to notice what we're doing. I actually had last winter a guy come to me and say, hey, I want to sell my farm. You know, I would like you to buy it. I'm going to have to drive by this farm on the highway every day when I'm going to town. I've had it my whole life. I need to know that this farm is going to be taken care of. And he actually gave me a chance to buy it at a better than market price because of what he's seen I was doing. I had another guy come to me and say he would like us to rent his farm. So I started it hoping to make more money off that I had. And it's actually helped me get and expand. And I know, Greg, Jim, you guys have done some similar test plots. There was a common theme about some other variables and factors that you were testing with population and planting dates. And 
I know some of that's probably proprietary information as you're both yield contest winners, but tell us a little bit more about some of those additional research and, and things that you're looking at as you've been making the move into using more biologicals on your operation. And Jimmy, maybe you could start for us. Um, yeah, this can't say everything, but there is timing of certain applications, planning, depth, uh, went through all of that. Um, the bios, you know, the, the thing about them, I tried a bunch of them to begin with before I met Chris and the issue was they just got thrown at me and I wasn't explained to me properly how what was supposed to be going on and that is another deal like in the bio world it's not like a herbicide where you can go spray it and the weed dies and you automatically know well I got my money worth if you don't realize what the bio is doing to the plant and keep hands on look at the structure of the way it's changing the plant Mother Nature throws a curveball all the time, whether it be weather, sunlight, rain, storm, whatever. Um, but you have to understand what it is doing building that plant. And once you get the feel of that and figure that out, then you can kind of move forward. But there has been a lot of testing going on for sure. Anything else to add, Greg? Well, I usually just do whatever he did it for the, year. the year before. I just try to do the following year, so it's pretty simple for us. But no, I think uh, you know one of the realizations that we had pretty quickly was because we we do feed out about twenty thousand head of hogs. So we got three million gallons of of manure to to apply, and and it didn't take long to figure out if in that manure there's a lot of N, P, and K and a lot of other micronutrients that are in that. And the first few years as you use it you do start to see that yield increase from that but then you get to a certain point that okay yeah we've that allows us to maybe improve yields by 10 percent but it doesn't continue to go up and and it plateaus again on you and you realize that if it was all about just applying nutrients to the soil if that's the only thing it was well I could just put twice as much out obviously and I could increase yield but if I do go, if I were to go and put twice as much out, I'll actually reduce yield because of what I'm tying up in the soil. So we, we realize very quickly that there has to be ways, we've got to figure out how to move these nutrients from non-extractable pools and we've got to make them so that they're plant available and that's where the biologicals and, and the constant focus on the soil health comes into place, how to make those nutrients and build that plant where it'll use them and to increase the nutrient pool that's available. Okay, well, I think it's safe to say we've proven this one false. So let's uh, continue right along here with kind of our second misconception, which is overspending on fertilizer is the only way to set record yields. And Matt, obviously you're a testament to this. Talk to us a little bit about the ROI and let's talk dollars and cents and bushels of what you've seen over the, because I know you've said really you've looked at it in a five year increment of maybe one years one and two, you didn't see a lot of difference, but by year five, there was a big difference on your farm. We, uh, yeah, this world of instant gratification, I'm not gonna say by biology and working with soils is something you're gonna go out and spray one day and two days later, you're gonna go, geez, I got new dirt here. And it, uh, it's a process and um, like these guys, I, all of our stories I, I'm gathering are kind of similar. I was mixing a lot of different companies 15 years ago, thinking I could grab the best here, the best there, the best there. And I didn't know what the heck I was doing. But, uh, and it, it was a mess. We used powdered sugars, you name it, we've tried it all back when we were figuring out this ROI deal. What I found was important was to get a company and get knowledge behind me, as I'm sure these guys would attest to. So, um, and uh, we just, as we started to take the fertilizer away and the soil started to change. I said first, like she said, maybe one to two years I didn't notice that the yields were taking off dramatically, but I did see a change in the plants and things. But then by year three, four, five, the soil aggregates and the texture of the soil um, did change. We were a very heavy tillage operation to start with. And um, I didn't start the biologicals or any of this stuff trying to get away from tillage, but I've actually gotten away from tillage just because as we've improve the biology of the soil, taking away the salts, the chlorides, all the commercial fertilizers, the texture and the aggregates of the soil have changed. Our yields now are starting to drastically ratch up. It, it took time, but now the soils 
have weaned themselves, maybe I would say, off of the commercial fertilizers and have uh, really started to respond. I mean, I'm seeing since I started this, bean yields have, for a whole farm average, are up probably 20 bushels with coming off the dry fertilizer. Corn's up 30, probably 40 bushel for a whole farm average over the past 10 years by taking away the fertilizers and going to a biological soil foliar type program. And with being you, you two both being yield winners, yield contest winners, that might be a common misconception when you read that in the headlines. I think the media sensationalizes it sometimes to say, wow, this guy got you know, 100 bushel per acre soybeans. But that's not practical to dump a lot of cost and inputs into a couple of 10 acres you know, to win these contests. So how are you doing that across your entire operations? And, and Jimmy, I think maybe it was you that mentioned it. it. It's kind of an addiction, right, to continue to do these yield contests to some extent. It, it is to some extent, yes. I've had a lot of people comment, you know, uh, you, you got the 148 because you dumped a pile of fertilizer money into the fertilizer. It's like you couldn't be more wrong. It's, it's been stereotyped for so long that you automatically, they assume you've spent two grand an acre to get this, and it's, and it's not true. Um, it, it, I found when I started chasing the high yield that it was going to do absolutely nobody any good if I couldn't have an ROI back and learning more of the soil and situations like that, I was able to, you know, still have an ROI at the end of the day. And what's the point in learning something if you can't go help you guys when you have a question and it's gonna cost more than it's worth the yield. So um, that's kind of way the path I went down and I knew I was missing something. I knew there would be another way. And I found Chris in the biologicals um, seven, eight years ago, something like that and we've transitioned over from there, um, cut the fertilizer way back. More placement where the fertilizer goes is huge. When that fertilizer is gonna break down, be available to plant is huge. Understanding the whole, the whole scheme of things, then you can cut out the fertilizer. Anything to add there, Greg? <clears throat> yeah, this past year, uh, we decided to try something. I'm a big believer in the demand for soy and it's gonna to continue to increase and for various reasons in the marketplace. But so we wanted to try, I said, let's see what we can do on, we had a 160 acre field that we averaged over 110 and on in 2020. So in 2021, we took an 80 of that and decided to try bean on bean to see what we could do. And could we hold those yields without them dropping off even though beans are a carbon negative uh, crop and we, we averaged 117 in 2021 on that. But the key thing is what, I've never even really said this to anybody because nobody asked me any questions. They usually ask Jimmy. But we the sprayer only went across that field four times and that included in the herbicide passes. I mean, it's not like we were, we were spending a lot of money on that. It was, the, it was all the work we had done for the years getting up to that point. And I think that's kind of what these guys are talking about. I mean, this isn't something that happens overnight, but if you're building the soil and you're doing the right things to make it work, you're gonna be able to actually reduce the inputs. Well, I think it's safe to say this one, uh, we've also proven false as well there. So our third myth that we're gonna talk about is high crop input costs <laughs> will prevent you from growing top end yields. Greg, I'm gonna turn this one back to you because I think you uh, segued nicely into that there with your last comment. Say that again. This, <laughs> <laughs> you always go to him first and then you figure out. <laughs> what do you have to share with us about high crop input costs will prevent okay. you from growing top end yields? Okay. Well, if you look at the, the crop input costs this year, I mean, we do have some on our, our I mean, we've, we're increasing on our herbicides. Um, some of those costs are going up, but I mean, the main drivers here are your N, P, and K. And, you know, I started five years ago in my presentations, I would say I firmly believe that somewhere down the road here that maybe it's 10 years or so down the road, we're gonna be spending more money on things like biologicals, things that are gonna improve soil health than what we're gonna be spending on N, P, and K. And people would look at you kind of like you were strange, which that's true, but anyway, <laughs> they, I don't think 
<clears throat> but what's happened now due to COVID, supply chain, war, all of these things that are happening that are driving that NP and K cost through the roof, I think farmers today, we all are looking at what are the, what, how can we, how can we maintain, yes, commodity prices are up, but we can't continue one of these, we can't just continue to ramp up our input costs. At some point, we've got to figure out how to control those. So I think this is going to end up being a big challenge long term for that, that dry fertilized industry is because the demand that they had prior to this to where we're at today, I don't think it's all going to come back. Just like COVID changed the, the way society is and changed it probably forever. And I think this, this run up in fertilized costs because everybody's looking for what's that day, what's that way that I can control my costs. I'm just really glad that we started on that a few years back um, because starting now, I mean, you got to start at some point, but you, know, you got to have that biological diversity in, in your soil. You've got to create that water extractable. You got to have that organic carbon in there. You got to have those things for the biology to make the, the nutrients that you already have. You, I mean, it, we've all spent all of this money for years. We've put into fertilized inputs. Now's the time for us to take advantage of it. And a quick follow up there, because you, you know, you talked about, you've been doing this for a couple of years now, but thinking back, how did you do that planning ahead process when you can't account for things like supply chain issues or shortages? How do you think through that? How do you have a long-term strategy? Well, I just knew there had to be other ways because it wasn't all about N, P, and K. And that's what it got, to. it was very, very simple for me. I, I just, you just know that, if, I mean, I did some of those things five, six, seven years ago where somebody would talk about, oh, we got to get this potassium up and I would, and I go, okay, I got to try this on 10 acres over here and I'll go spread 600 pounds of, of potash and guess what, on that 10 acres, yields dropped. Over here where I was doing less, I had higher yields. And that, that stayed that way for the next two or three years because uh, I no longer had a balance of nutrition in the soil and I didn't have the right biology working, freeing up those nutrients that I needed at the right time. Jimmy, you have an interesting story from last year's growing season. Uh, one of your main soybean fields flooded, and that certainly impacted your growing season last year. But tell us a little bit more about that. About uh, the structure, uh, how the beans came out? Or, yeah. It was, <clears throat> they were about three or four foot underwater for about 36 hours. Um, I'd done wrote them off, covered in mud. Um, I ran in furrow biologicals with starter um, I feel that's the reason for them to keep pushing on. If I didn't have that in furrow, there was no way they would have. But they ended up getting about 12, 14 inches high, and they had about 100 to 144 pods on them. I um, only hit them once in the summer. Um, I didn't know what they were going to do, so I didn't want to throw any more money at them. Um, they still were pretty amazing beans. But back to that question, you know, the last couple of years, Greg and I have talked, and sometimes less is more and we're learning that you know you, overboard is can be an issue you can't push too much but as far as the placement with the bios the quality of the starter you're using you know that that's the huge part you can go well that starter is a little higher 100 percent ortho food grade well of course it's going to be higher because it's 100 percent available to the plant compared to an 80 20. So sometimes just because it's higher, your benefits in the end may be better, but you can use less also because it is available. We, you have to know when it's going to break down and be available to the plant. As long as just like if you're applying in, you know, split applying is, I changed to that probably three or four years ago, five years ago. Um, I can use a lot less in and split applying, concentrating where I'm running it and get way better yields. So that's another way to imp cut the input costs. And when you say less is more, was that a minds, mindset, mindset shift for you? Uh, yeah, it was, it, it was kind of eye opener. In the first year, I thought, oh, I just, you know, I did something wrong. And now it's two years in a row. And it's like, you know, as far as trips with spray or something, it's like we're, we've went overboard, pump the brakes. Yeah. I think he and I have talked about that quite a bit. It's, uh, the last two years in a row, for me, both corn and beans, the areas that I had actually tried to push the hardest, those weren't my best deals. So you can't go too much. 
Just to add to, you asked Greg this, at the start of this how he set his mindset that this was going to work. Going back 15 years now when, when I started to meet Chris, back to like he said with the learning box and the fertilizer, I knew there had to be something different. And I also what kind of led me this way on top of the ROI was I was convinced, just like the Netherlands and a lot of Europe, that the government was going to get involved in farming at some point in time. We have the Des Moines River going into Des Moines and they're always lawsuit and stuff for nitrates in the water. And I was convinced at some point in time they're going to start to regulate our NPK. So I wanted to start getting ahead of the curve before the government got involved. So that kind of started to sway me this way. Now the government hasn't got involved yet, but as luck would have it with shortages of fertilizer now and all these countries banning uh, exports of fertilizer to us to protect their own food supply. Luckily enough, as luck would have it, I've gotten ahead of the curve and, and I've seen what I can do with biology. This whole winter, while people are scared about P&K prices, I'm not even sure where P&K prices are because I haven't, I haven't looked at that market. I've cut my N, you know, N is definitely a large factor, but instead of 1.2s, 1.1s, 1s, I'm running 0.5s, 0.6s. I've found I've, by placing, like he said, the Y drops, placing it at multiple times, the right places, and with the biology, I, I actually don't need near as much nitrogen as I used to. And Matt, I think you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but elaborate on it. You've seen physical changes in your soil. It, it didn't happen year one, two, three, but over all these years, it has changed drastically. I mean, like I said, we were multiple tillage paths, fall tillage, didn't matter if we had a wet fall or, or dry, we were convinced that if you didn't get it worked in the fall, you, you couldn't get a good crop the next spring. It had to be worked. We work it twice in the spring. And I didn't start this, like I said, didn't have any intentions or goals of trying to get away from tillage, but the aggregates, the texture, the soil has it's gotten so loose that it's, I've gone to almost 100% no-till now just from the way the soil has changed the percolation of water. I mean, we get, you know, it seems like it never rains and then also it rains way too much and uh, the water doesn't run off as much. It, uh, yeah, the soil has really changed. Jimmy or Greg, have you guys seen that same type of drastic change in your soil or soil composition? Oh, absolutely. Um, BioRed is changed mine 180 degrees. Um, I can do a lot less in, um, just the porosity in the soil. Um, it's more acceptable to whatever I throw at it, but it, it is, it's, it's huge. The respiration porosity has really changed. Yeah, and <clears throat> these guys have actually been using um, biology longer than I have. So yeah, in first, first year, I saw a little bit but as the years have went on, and now I'm three to four years into it, now I'm, is when I'm really starting to see the dramatic shifts in it. And it's been a long-term investment, and that's something that you guys mm -hmm. knew going into it. What This wasn't gonna be something that changed it in year one and two. You knew you were gonna be doing this for a long time to come. What was that process like of, of knowing that and using that to plan long-term? Greg, maybe we'll start back with you. Well, <laughs> don't you feel a loop? I know. Yeah, I'm sorry if I seem distracted, but I, I was so excited. I before we came here, I asked my wife. I said, "Honey, I said, I, I said, just be honest with me. I said, in in your wildest dreams, did you ever think I'd get to share the stage with Jimmy?" <laughs> 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 and she looked at me. She said, "Honey, just be honest with you." You aren't in my wildest dreams. <laughs> so, so, so this whole thing, you know, I'm kind of distracted sitting up here tonight, you know. So I'm sorry, You're Delaney. You're starstruck sitting next to Jimmy. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but no, I think Chris did a great job of coaching me in the beginning. You know, we we knew in, in the start that we weren't going to be able to make dramatic shifts in what we were doing. We have. We have to not. We have to build the biological. We've got to build the the population. We've got to feed the population. We've got to maintain the population of it. We need a diverse population of it. Um, so we knew that this was not a one-year process. That this is, was a change in the mindset, a change in what we were going to do. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's <clears throat> some things that that make you really think. Like, and we have a 40-acre field that had 
my whole life as a child there was a cow pasture in it it was 10 acres in the center and when we eliminated that about 20 years ago for the first five six seven eight years you could see the plant the health of the plant the strength the robustness of the plant where that pasture was you could see the yield monitor you would see 20 30 bushel just as soon as where you hit where that old fence row used to be and over the course of time we lost that benefit that we had from that and i knew we saw the yields then they leveled they went back down to where the what the rest of the field was and i knew right then that was another obvious signal to me was okay I'm actually doing harm that well, I'm farming the biology out of this soil now how do we go back and, and create that again I think it's Matt just I was gonna say there. I seen the exact same thing old cow pasture where the silos were about 10 acres just like Greg's talking and we used to come to that corn would be a foot taller beans would be taller more pods yield would go up and and it was dropping off too and I knew I wanted to, when we started this 15 years ago, my kids were little, they're 17 and 14 now, but I knew I wanted them to have a farm when I was done. I was lucky enough to find uh, the farmer that I worked for that gave me a, that stepped back and gave me a chance for the farm. I wanted to have uh, operational, healthy soil for the kids when they wanted to get into the farm. So I knew whatever I was doing to what used to be that cow pasture wasn't good. Just like, it's funny that Greg said the same story. I'm like, well, we can't be doing something right if if this ground was doing better before and now it's going downhill. So I just find that story interesting. Well, I think this one's also safe to say we've dispelled it. It's false as well. Folks, I'll give another quick plug here. If you have questions, we're getting close to that time where we're gonna open it up to the audience. I see a couple of good ones have floated in here. You can again scan that QR scan code sitting on your table or you can head to pigeonhole.at on your phones there and type in those questions as we get ready to answer some questions here in a little bit. But the fourth uh, misconception we want to potentially dispel today is talking about yield plots. Conducting high yield plots is just a luxury. I know that each of you guys do some of that. <laughs> Jimmy, you're laughing, so I'm gonna turn it right over to you. Well, I don't know that it's a luxury. Um, it's more back to maybe an addiction type deal and seeing what you can push the limits to, but but it's a lot of work. Um, there's a lot of head scratching, a lot of learning, a lot of testing to see correlation wise what's going on. Um, so I will, don't necessarily call it a luxury, I believe. I would go with maybe calling it frustrating when there you put you all go. that work into it and the stuff you did less you yielded more. And you know, we only got one growing season. It's not do Brazil it. where we can have a couple. Yeah. If you mess up, you got three. Instead of luxury, I know that you were frustrating. Good information, I, but frustrating. Absolutely. And I, I think the greatest thing about it for us is, is that it forces us to, because if we say, if we're going to commit to it, then we're going to do it. We're going to do our best at it. So it forces us to develop a plan from the beginning to the end. And it forces us to work that plan every week. And that just makes us better farmers, what we learn from that on all the rest of the acres. And so that's why I think. <clears throat> I mean, I think everybody should do it because it's just, it, it's like anytime you got to present material or something, I mean, you, it forces you to, you got to be ready and forces you to become better at it. And I think that's what, to me, I mean, I think it makes us better farmers if you're. Yeah, you got to try something new every year, yeah. change up, because if you stay in the same rut, it's not going to get any better. Yeah, and in that same vein, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about what some of those things are that you're testing year in and year out. Is it production? Is it biologicals? Is it other things? Jimmy, what are you testing year over year? Um, it's strictly all bios. Um, year after year, different products, changing things all the time. I'm getting more familiar with them, different strains. Um, but that's that's the main thing. Um, the timing of when I'm applying, um, growth stages how I can affect that plan at what time of its life and have the best outcome. Greg, what about you? I think it's those things plus population trials. It's when to apply a particular nu nutrient, whether I'm trying to drive reproductive energy into the plant or vegetative growth, what it is that I'm doing, what, what, 
what nutrient am I going to apply now? Do I, am I going to get the response that I'm looking for from a hormonal standpoint? Those are the kind of things that we're looking at testing. I mean, I, I know this last year, Jimmy and I were both measuring stem diameter. We were do, you know, doing things out there with calipers that, you know, never done before, but you start to understand the impact of how the, the size of the, of the diameter of the stem, even if you can increase that, you can increase the productivity of your plant. And so I think we'll just try to look at every, everything we can from the beginning to the end. Diversify the dollars, take them from one spot that, you know, lower in population. What am I going to do with them dollars now? I'm going to go improve my health somewhere. I'm going to improve something later in the year. So it's moving the dollars around and having a better outcome, I believe. And I think that's, that's critical, what he's just saying right there, which is, is, I mean, that's really what we're trying to do is figure out how to move, them or move the dollars around to increase the ROI. It's not how do we add dollars. Right. If you ask what we're testing, I'd say we're testing everything. You go back over the years, you name it, we've had it on the farm, we've tested it. You got timing, placement, products, different products put together. I mean, if you're not trying something every year, you're wasting a year, I, I feel. I mean, you gotta be trying something, testing something. I'm, there ain't much you probably couldn't mention that we haven't tried at some point in time. And when you're setting up those test spots, how are you deciding where to do it? Because Jimmy, I know you farm some dry land, you farm some irrigated acres as well. How are you deciding where to put those test plots? I move them around. I don't keep them all in one spot. Um, it's just kind of between my rotation of what I what I got going. But it, the, it's not one direct spot usually. Um, some farms are better than others, so that's pretty much how I narrow it down. <laughs> Greg or, or Matt, do you guys have any system in place on how you're going about? But with that, that being said, I will add that by the use of bios, my farm quality as a whole has changed dramatically. Steep sugar dirt has, you know, normally 150, 60 bushel yield rolled out 249 average this year. So we are headed in the right direction. So they're coming together. For me, it depends on what I'm trying to test. Sometimes I want to test the poorest ground with this product or the best. Sometimes I got to move the test because maybe I've had biologicals in this area for a few years. And, and you know, if I'm going to try, I need some ground that hasn't had the biological, you know, to test because as you're building the soil up. So it, it's just a process of what I'm trying to test and what I'm looking for for an answer, I guess, where we move it to. Yeah. We we farm ground that's gra gravel sand of a CEC of three and uh, 200 yards from it, we can have black muck that's got a CEC of 30. So we've got to figure out <clears throat> how on the different soil types, we've got to do experimenting on all of those because we can't just become good at one of them because we got to spread it across all of those different soil types. And it's a different program for each one. All right, I think this one's pretty safe to say we've also busted this. Misconception is false as well. We're getting really close. We've got some really good questions I'm excited to ask here, but final misconception that we're gonna dispel up here on stage. <laughs> Yield enhancers are economical for all farmers. Craig, are you ready to answer this one? No, not really. <laughs> Yield, Yield enhancers are economical for all, all farmers. farmers. I think that's it. I think this one's true. You do? Yeah. I mean, I, I think we, uh, um, <clears throat> I mean, I think that there's, there's all, there's things out there that we've all been doing that we learn over time that we can, uh, um, we, we learn that we can apply across all of our acres. It's, it's not just about, you know, obviously we're trying to drive yield, but we're trying to do it economically. So I, I use a perfect example of the BioCore product of, of BioVance. We talked about it yesterday. We see something we spend less than four dollars on, on that's going to have a thirty to forty dollar return. What we're seeing right now on soybeans is an example. And all we did was we just replaced the talc that we were already using with BioCore, and we see a yield response. But do you think this is the secret sauce to use on on farms, Jimmy? Yield enhancers. To a certain extent. The quality, again, back to the quality of products are huge. Um, I'll say that forever because there's so much misconception on some of it. Um, 
but yes, it's it's very easy for everybody to improve something somewhere. Um, but once again, don't overspend what isn't going to be your outcome, and know know what you're putting on. Um, but yes, it's economical to everybody. I mean, just like if you're going to have some, you know, put some bios out. Just make sure you know, like, does it have anaerobic, aerobic? Micro living microorganisms in it are they both in there is one out you know just figure out what you're going to use but it's definitely possible for everybody yeah because all of these biostimulants have both a, a, a no matter what you apply no matter what you do you're going to they're going to have a positive to it but you're also going to have there's cause and effect you're going to have an effect that maybe you don't realize what's going to happen on the back absolutely side. and so you know, that's why you've got to test those things out in multiple areas. Maybe don't get carried away in year one to start to understand, does this product work? Is it going to do what I need it to do? And, and understand what's the effect on the backside of it. This question's almost too big and too broad. It's almost like a trick question. It, uh, there's definitely a use and a place for a yield enhancer. But I like to describe it like a fuel additive that you go uptown and you can go to this whole shelf of all these, you know, price of gas. Now you can go to the shelf and every one of these drugs says it'll improve mileage one to three gallons. You buy them all and you pour them all in, you're not going to auto go from 20 to 100 miles a gallon. You can go out and listen to all these companies, buy all these and yield enhancers you want. You're not all suddenly going to get three or 400 bushel corn. They have a place, they have a use, but you better understand them and use them at the right time in the right quantity like they're saying. I think every, every farm has a, a purpose for them, but you just need to know how to use them. And Matt, I wanted to ask too, because I don't think we've gotten to talk a ton about this, but with some of the yield enhancers and things that you've put in your operation, you've been able to raise your APH on corn pretty significantly. It's, uh, I don't like giving the credit to just a yield enhancer though. It's, it's been the whole program. I mean, BioVant has product that improves my soil, that helps the seed, the BioCore. You've got the foliar products. It's been a total program, not just here's your jug, go put this on and you're gonna pick up 20 bushels. We've used the whole system approach and we've been able to pick up, when I started this 14 years ago, low 200 farm APH corn, now we're running 230. I think this year when I did insurance the other day it was like 239. Soybeans used to be 57. We pulled our farm average up to 68 but it hasn't been, here's your magic serum, here's your one jug. It's been a system approach of improving the soil, starting with soil products, seed treatments, foliars. It's a whole program. Well, I think it's safe to say that yield enhancers are economical for our farmers. So we're gonna say this one, stamp this one as true. And with that, we're gonna turn it over to some fantastic questions we got from the audience here. A lot of great ones, but I think this is a really good one that we haven't really touched a whole lot on, but are you guys using cover crops as part of your crop rotation, crop mix as well? I can start with that. I was not using any cover crops when I started with biologicals. Like I said I was heavy tillage. I, soil had changed. I went away from uh, tillage and started going no-till. The three years ago, I seen and read all the articles and magazines. I started dabbling small plots, just like all the products, 10, 20, 30 acre strips in the corn and the beans, trying some different covers, um, seeing good things with it. So I'm still testing, but I'm doing a lot more acres of, of covers and planting green into it, but I'm just getting started in that. And it's just kind of a natural process. I didn't plan for it to go that direction, but seems like the next step. I do not, but um, it may be a step in the future. I haven't decided, but as of the time, right now I'm not. Yeah, I, uh, when I left a, a week ago from the house, a third of my ground was underwater. Uh, we farm ri a lot of river bottoms ground. Uh, so obviously, and that usually happens every winter at some point. So cover crops aren't an option there, but I do, <clears throat> I understand, I, I do believe in them enough that as an example, for this year, first time in 20 years, I planted a lot of wheat on my high ground. And, and well, that's, I mean, I'm harvesting it, but for the same reasons as a cover crop, I was trying to accomplish that same, the same thing. Just to add to it, back to Greg and talking about his beans on beans and uh, listening to a speech yesterday. Part of why I've started to implement and do more of the covers is for the carbon. 
I also dried some beans on beans, and, and you're not going to get the carbon into the soil like you will with corn or wheat or high residue crops. So I'm trying to use if, if we, as we test and go to different cropping systems, like say a bean on bean, I want the cover crop in there for added carbon. You know, I'm letting, trying to get the cover as big as I can to get carbon in the replacement of the cycle. Oh, Greg, you'll appreciate this one. A few folks in the audience want to know if you have a comedy hour that they can attend. <laughs> <laughs> I've asked for one, but no. This was your next best no. thing then, I yeah. guess. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit more of a serious question here, but a lot of folks actually also want to know, what's your BioVant cocktail mix to produce these kinds of substantial returns? That's, that's, that's I, kind of I can take that one and say that's tomorrow morning. private. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. paper, I want to write down what Jimmy in the booth. says. We can cover more there. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I was just saying tomorrow morning down at the BioVant booth at 9 a.m., we're going to have a, I'm going to be talking and doing a speech and we can kind of do a question and answer and maybe get into more depth on products then. But uh, we're going to kind of just keep this a little bit less in the product side, I guess. That'd take yep. us a while. Yep. There's a few things I run in Faro, um, but they're all there for a reason. It's, it, it doesn't cost a terrible amount. Um, but yeah. Jimmy, I think you mentioned this earlier too, but there are a lot of other companies in the biological space that also say they have similar products to this, or maybe that do have a secret sauce component to them. So a, a couple of folks asked, you know, what separates BioVant, in your opinion, from those other biologicals that are out there on the marketplace? Okay, about, for instance, BioRed, um, we have a BC and IF version, four to five living strains of microorganisms. Um, there is no other company that can add all that in one jug because they will kill each other when they get together. And by the way this works is the encapsulation process that we have in the, the bio itself. Um, it's encapsulated, you can throw it in water, starter, anything you want, fertilizer, um, 10 hours after it's in the ground, then it comes out of its encapsulation and goes to work. So. There's no other company that I know of that can have more than one strain of living microorganism in there without killing the other one. So that's a huge part for us. I would add to it also the diversity of what they have in the products and the lineup of products. There's a lot of, like you've been saying, secret sauces or just take this jug, apply it once, you're done. Um, BioVant starts with, they got soil products, like I said, the seed products, foliar products, I think there's 30, 40 different products. It's a complete system. We're not just trying to sell you one thing for all farmers, you know, out of 48 states, there's a lot of different soils, a lot of different ways guys farm, tillage and hydrous, liquid, whatever. Um, they have a diverse lineup of products to fit whatever needs you're trying to accomplish. Anything to add, Greg? Nope. <laughs> all right. <laughs> And I would think say they covered another, it. I, I think another thing too that is a common theme I heard from each of you guys ahead of Commodity Classic was that Chris Masters, the CEO, has been very accessible to all three of you throughout this process. And you guys can text him or call him and ask him questions and he'll answer pretty uh, quickly, it seems too. Yeah, it was huge when I was first starting out. Um, he's taught me a lot educated me and it didn't matter we talked every day and it didn't matter what time of day it was and we've built a heck of a friendship relationship over this um but he has taught me a, a lot on the bio side and i couldn't have done it without him that's for sure well let's take a couple more quick questions here another good one a lot of folks upvoted was what are your phosphorus and potassium levels in the soil and how have they trended over the years we're all quiet, I can step in, I guess. Mine have all come more into balance. When I started this in Northeast Iowa clay soils, I was very high mag. And no matter how much potash and stuff I was pouring on, and you hear all these talks about how you need to get your, your K levels up and your base saturation higher, and no matter what I poured on due to my high mags, high calcium, there was no room for the potash, just the K dish didn't show up on a test. I could spend as much money as I wanted. I wasn't gonna get over a one or a one whatever. 
because I had a 25 or whatever mag and a 70 something calcium and there's no room left. Um, as I've gone through this process, my K levels have come up almost a couple points in the last 10 years. I'm up into the threes or higher on a lot. My P levels have come up and my mag levels have dropped way down. I mean, instead of being in the mid to upper 20s, now we're down in the 12s to 15s on a lot of the soils. It, uh, I've become a lot more balanced than where I was when I started. I mean, and the trend has definitely been up on my P and K, even though I haven't been applying it. It uh, actually shows up on the test now, I guess, however you want to say it now that other things have come out and balanced out more in the soil. Yeah, I, and that's why I think that's the key. I mean, just what Matt was referring to there, right? Because we have, we all have this pool of nutrients that they're, they're not accessible to you. And the only way you can make them accessible is through the biology. I mean, the, the, you can take something and, you know, you can go all the way from non-extractable to an ex to, to the extractable pool to then what's accessible to the plant. And those, those things can tie up those nutrients. You can move them from <clears throat> not available all the way over to available and then they can actually move all the way back over here to not available again. It's the biology. It's, the, it's what we're doing within the soil because this is the key thing that I didn't understand for a long time was <clears throat> that you know when your biology is working, which is what Matt was just talking about, when your soil test, because well, what we're going to get on a standardized soil test is going to be only the inorganic form that our nutrients are in, not the full pool. When that pool doesn't get smaller over time, like what Matt's seeing, he's, he's, he's using those nutrients over here, his plants, but that pool is not getting smaller. Instead, it's, it's becoming more available all the way from the non-extractable pool. pool. Your, your biology is what's creating that and moving that over to a usable form. So you're actually increasing what you're seeing is, what I believe, what you just said, which is exactly, I think, what we're all trying to accomplish is you're increasing what's available without even adding any. And that's the awesome part about it. It's the scariest part of the whole process. I remember when I first met Chris and we were going to start this, I told him, look, I'm renting all of my land from this guy that gave me my start. I cannot have the neighbors that are trying to outbid me on this ground telling him, hey, this guy ain't spreading fertilizer. He's just mining your ground. I had, we soil test every year, and I had to show him that I wasn't mining in that pool. I mean, I'm building his soil. If he were to go to try and sell that farm, the soil tests are by far better now than when I started. And he, used, he, he applied a lot of fertilizer. I applied a lot of fertilizer at the start. We weren't showing anything. Now we're finally balancing the whole cycle, and, and it's better soil for it. And it's definitely easier to change a range if you're having an issue in one of your tissue samples it is way easier with the biological activity to fluctuate those numbers than it was prior to using it good point well i think that's a good place to end it with you guys and we're going to bring up just here to end things today the ceo of biovant chris masters to close us out today Can we get everybody on the panel a round of applause for participating and being with us? Thank you guys. I want to thank everybody in attendance that came today. As Matt said, tomorrow at 9 o'clock, he'll be uh, presenting some information that's happened on his farm. Just real quick, the, the packet that you received, there's some information in there. They've referred to some of the products today, BioRed BC, BioRed IF. As a company, we stand behind the product, the technology as a whole. We feel like we have a very uh, unique process of how we have formulated biologicals for the seed, the soil, and plant. There's a 100% performance guarantee that we're offering this year in 2022. If you use it in furrow, if you broadcast it on your soil, for whatever reason you don't get your money back at the end of the year, we'll cut you a check back in 60 days from getting your data. So it's pretty simple in, simple out. There's an agreement for when you sign. We want to make sure that we can get this on your acre so that way you can start seeing the improvement going forward. One of the things that these guys have said without saying it is that you have to commit to the system. And I think so many times we want to get 
one in, two out so fast. And the thing about biology, it is a course of time. It took you 13, 14, 15 years to get to this state. Now it's gonna take us a little bit of time to heal and recover to get us back to a better state than we were. So time is of the essence. I would encourage it not to wait any longer. These guys have an edge. They have the edge because they started five, six, seven years ago. This is gonna be your year, 2022. So where do we come back in 2027 for Commodity Classic? Maybe you have a similar story yourself. So I encourage you to talk to us. The show's gonna be over today. Come back tomorrow morning, we're available. I will ask all of the guys that are with us, ladies that are with us, if you'll stand up, if you have our team, BioBant team, on the way out, if you have any questions, you wanna talk about the products, guys, gentlemen, go ahead and stand on up. You can make your way to the back. Um, ask them questions. If there's anything that you wanna talk about specifically, there were some great questions asked. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to all of them, but if you have any specific questions, feel free to stop by and ask them as well. Thank you all for your time and have a good show. Thank you. The first question. Oh, I wanna, I wanna announce one quick thing if I could. I froze like. As a company, um, there's no, right now, we're here for the National Corn Growers Association. But as a company, there's no national soybean contest. Uh, here in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna, we're gonna be releasing a, a plan. Follow us on social media, Twitter or Facebook. We're gonna be hosting internally as a company a national soybean contest. So there's some just a few requirements, but if you wanna participate in that soybean contest, again, make sure you follow us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook, and we'll be releasing some data on that as well.